we really want him to flood this place? Hallelujah.
that there in this church, I mean across the world, in the body of Christ, I believe revival is about to break out. Amen? Because I believe people are going to be listening for that trumpet call. Amen? Because it's getting close. Amen? It's getting close. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. You can be seated. Thank you guys for a wonderful job. Hallelujah. God bless you children's prayers. You're dismissed. Praise the Lord. Excuse me for all my sin. Given me this morning, I just can't hold it back a little bit. Yeah, no. But uh, you know, in, in experience the presence of the Lord. It says in the presence of the Lord, there's fullness of joy. Amen. And 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 and, and He inhabits the praises of His Amen. people. Amen. And there's a lot of joy missing from a lot of lives right now. Amen. But a, a merry heart's like a medicine. Amen. Amen. You know, it, uh, it 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 heals the bones and it, and it gives us joy. And we studied this morning in Sunday school, Philippians uh, chapter four eight which says whatever things be true, whatever things be noble, you know, whatever things be just, and if there's any good report, to think on these things. And we need to know that what comes in is what's going to come out. And, you know, Jesus will turn whatever's in your vessel into, into the wine of his presence and his Holy Spirit. But begin in your life to let God rule through his word in your heart and mind. Amen. And don't let the things of this world overcome you because it said in the last days everything that can be shaken will be shaken and what's left remain is going to be God will be standing on it so don't be standing in the sand that gets washed away but be standing on that solid rock and let the word of God build your house and keep you going uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength Amen. Amen. stay in the joy praise Amen. God praise, praise the Lord. God Tim I believe you're right I believe there's a lot of people in here, my brothers and sisters that would agree, that the Lord is getting ready in these last days to do the Joel 2.28 thing. He's going to pour out His Spirit. But Tim, you know, judgment begins in God's house. We are God's people called by His name. Repent, Repentance, when it comes, is when you're going to have revival. We've been a church that we've been hiding our lights under a bushel. It's time to come out. How in the world are we going to go out and save the world if we're a mingle with the world? He said, come out from amongst them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. We go, we're go. we separated. We've been set apart. We're the children of the Most High God. We need to start acting like it. We need to be bold like a lion from the pride of Judah. It's time to rise up and be the army God's called us to be and not sit back and be the soldiers over here that's lost track of time, shining his boots or trying to get his hand all right. we got to rise up and be the children of God that God's called us to be, filled with the Spirit of God, filled with boldness to go forth and to share this faith that we have in this mighty God. If he's such a big God, that's what we need to be taking out between these four walls. We're separated people. We're a holy people. And that's what he's called us to do, Tim. The army of God needs to rise up. Right. But I want to tell you what, it's been burning in my heart for a long while, Tim, that repentance has got to come. He starts here because the people can't see us as a holy people or righteous people. The world's not going to see it. we got to quit mingling with them. They can't deal with Christians because we're so mingled in with them. But it's time to rise up. If we say we're saved, born again, we need to start acting like it. We need to rise up and get out. I was out with this little girl yesterday. The Spirit of the Lord come upon me. It's, it's a, the hour is late, Tim. The hour is late. I can nearly hear the trumpet of Gabriel. 
I can almost hear that call, Tim. It's time that we rise up and share what we've got with this world. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, people need leadership, don't they? People need leadership. Some people are more natural leaders. Some people are more natural followers. But we as a people, we need leadership. That's why we have a president. That's why we have different people. That's why the, that's why God designed the church in such a way that we have leadership within the church. Because we as people need leaders. That's why the Bible compares us to sheep. Now, I'm not going to get off on a tangent. Most everybody probably, if you're on Facebook, you, you probably thought I was going to go a certain direction. But I'm not. Hallelujah. But but we are, aren't we? We are a little bit like sheep. We need someone to lead us. And I, and I see that more and more as time goes in the, in the times that we're in. And, and I'm not saying that just because you hear people make the comments that we're all like sheep because everybody's wearing masks. I'm not saying it for that reason. But I, I noticed something this past week as I began to watch people. As all this has been transpiring, I've been watching people when I'm in a public place. And I watch the way they act and what they do and what they're looking for. And they're looking for people to take the lead. People are scared to take the lead on their own. They're looking for people that will take the lead. And let me tell you something. I'm not worried about whether you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask. I, I can care less, honestly. But what I am worried about is a group of people that are willing to share their faith. A group of people that are willing to tell other people, just like Lewis was saying, that the time is short. We need to get back to where we begin to hear those messages again. I remember when I was a kid, I was playing basketball at a neighbor's house one time. He pulled up in his driveway with me and another boy was there playing basketball. We didn't know he drove a church bus. He drove a church bus for Trinity. when We, we lived over off the of Raven Road there. And he said, Jesus is coming. He said, the time's short. And I thought, you're crazy. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. And, and, and then once I got saved, I remember those things. And he stayed on us about that. He stayed on us about that. He said, you need to get on this church bus. You need to let me take you to church because Jesus is coming. And if you don't know him, you're not going to be ready. And he was freaking me out. I ain't kidding. And, and I didn't know any, anything at that time. I hadn't been saved. hadn't ever been in church. I didn't know any of that stuff. But I wasn't about to get on that church bus because I thought he was a nut. But, but he began to share those things. And what we need is a group of people in the body of Christ that is not afraid to begin to share that message. Because I'm telling you right now, we're fixing to hear the trumpet. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I believe we could see that in our Amen. lifetime. Amen. Amen. We may be that generation Amen. that gets called up. Hallelujah. It's close. Amen. And I don't want to get too far in my message, but but we the, the body of Christ needs people that are willing to be leaders. Amen. I watched a movie one time, and, and I think it was actually on a, on just a, a regular channel because I got a feeling it would have been full of foul language and I would have never watched it. But it was We Were Soldiers. Mel Gibson, I believe, is is the way that that movie goes. Mel Gibson played in it, and they was they was about to go over to Vietnam, and I don't know what his rank was, but he he was he was over a, a group of men, and he said uh, he said I'm going to be the first one on the battlefield, and I'm going to be the last one off. Mm. Let me tell you something. That is that is an example of leadership, mm -hmm. and we as believers in Christ, we need to be ready to be the first ones right. out there sharing our faith, Amen. out there telling people. About what can come if they don't trust in the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need to be the ones that are that are this step in that way of leadership. Because this is the thing. As I said, many people are natural born leaders. Many people are natural born followers. But this is the thing, though. Every one of us is called to be a leader in some way, some fashion. Some of us is dad. Some of us is mom. Some of you is grandparents. We are all called to be leaders in some way. Some as pastors. Some as teachers. Some as as leaders in the church in different ways. We are all called to lead somebody. Amen. And we are all called to go and try to lead somebody to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The past few weeks, the past few weeks we've been in Joshua. We've been looking at, at this story in chapters 9 and 10. And, and Joshua was a leader. Amen. Joshua was the leader that, that God called after Moses led Israel out of Egypt. He called Joshua to take Israel and begin to lead them into the promised land and conquer the land that God had given them. Amen. We've seen the story where, where Joshua, he had his mistake with Gibeon, and he believed the lie, and he allowed Gibeon to, they made a treaty with Gibeon. We remember that. And then God began to turn things around for the good. 
Amen. He began to turn things around for the good. We talked about that last week. And the coalition of kings that, that, that come against them. And God gave jo Joshua and Israel the victory over these kings. Over those five kings. And I felt led that this morning we spent one more Sunday in Joshua chapter 10. As I want to show you something this morning. So if you will, turn to Joshua chapter 10. We're going to look in verses 12 through 15 to start off with this morning. If you will, stand for the reading of God's word this morning. If you will, hold your Bibles up in there and repeat this after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe it's the absolute truth. I believe it's inspired of the Holy Ghost. And I believe I can pattern my life after it. I look at your neighbor and say, so can you. Hallelujah. In verse 12, it says, On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, uh, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of uh, Agalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself against on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before since, uh, before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with Israel to the camp. At Gilgal. Father, I pray that you help me to preach your word this morning. And Lord God, I pray that your word just goes forth and it cuts to our hearts, Lord God, and that we become doers of your word and not only hearers of your word. And I pray, Lord, that you fill us all full of the Holy Spirit this morning and make soul winners out of each one of us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You know, God is the God of the impossible. Amen. amen. Many people question this text that I just read in Joshua chapter 10. Many people question this text. They, they have a hard time believing this text. Many Christians, believe it or not, have a hard time believing that this is real. When you begin to talk about Joshua chapter 10 and, and, and the sun standing still, when you begin to talk about Jonah being swallowed up in the belly of a big fish, when you begin to tell these stories that we all heard in Sunday school and in BBS and all those things, when you talk to people that are Christians, that, that they go to church every Sunday, they'll say, I don't know if I really believe this story. I've heard it several times when they say, I just, I don't know if that's really real. I don't think you're supposed to take that one literally, they would say. But let me tell you something. God is the God of the impossible. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular part of the text because I don't have to explain God. Amen. I don't have to explain that God is real. I don't have to explain that God can do whatever he wants. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you a few things here. Listen, if you can believe in creation, then you can believe this story. Amen. If you can believe in the virgin birth, you can believe in this story. Amen. 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 Because the thing of it is, God created everything and he can do whatever he wants with it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He can do whatever he wants with it. So many times we try to let science prove the Bible or we try to let science prove who God is. Listen, God is not subject to science. Amen. Science is, is a thing of man. Amen. Right. He's not subject to that. Right. I read this in a commentary. It's Warren Wiseby in his commentary on this, on this text. He said, if God can't perform this miracle described in Joshua chapter 10, then he can't perform any miracle. That's right. And he is imprisoned by his own creation, unable to use or suspend the very laws he built into it. I have a difficult time believing in a God like that, is what he said. And I agree with you. Because if God can't perform this miracle, he can't perform any miracle. That's right. Amen. If he can't perform this miracle, then how in the world can we believe that Jesus came and died and rose again all for us? Amen. How can we believe that? If God wants to make the sun stand still, he can make the sun stand still. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Look with me in Joshua chapter 10. We're going to look at verse, verse 1 again as we did last week. I want to show you something this morning that I think is very relevant for today. In verse 1 it says, In Adonai Zedek, King of Jerusalem heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed him. And uh, doing to Ai and his kings as he had done to Jericho and its kings. And that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and become their allies. Verse 3 it says, So Adonai king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jama, Jephthah, king of Lachish, Deber, king of Eglon, Come up here and attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, 
the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jamoth, Jar Jarmuth, uh, Lachish, and Eglon, joined forces, and they moved up with all their troops and took position against Gibeon and attacked it. Now, I know you probably think, well, we just read that last week. You're gonna, how long are you going to go over this thing? But, but go back one more chapter to verse nine, or verse 1 of chapter 9. And I'm going to show you something. Now, when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country and the western foothills along the entire coast of the Mediterranean Sea as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. This is the same coalition, as I said this last week, the same coalition in chapter 9, verse 1, as it is in chapter 10, verse 1. Minus Gideon. Same coalition. You see in chapter 10, verse 1, who the ringleader of this coalition is. It's Adonaziah, the king of Jerusalem. You caught that, right? The name Adonaziah means Lord of Righteousness. It means Lord of Righteousness. This king of Jerusalem, he's a pagan king inhabiting Jerusalem. Jerusalem will soon be overtaken by Israel and it will become Israel's land. Amen. It's already Israel's land. They just have to overtake it. God's done promised it to them. Amen. He's inhabiting the land that God gave to the people of Israel. He led a confederation of kings, five kings, to attack Joshua and the Israelites. I want to show you something real quick. Joshua, in Hebrew, is Joshua. Joshua. Which means God, God saves. God is salvation is what that means. Joshua in the Greek, which is what we read in the New Testament, we read the Greek translated into English, means Jesus. Amen. It's the same name. Amen. It's the same name. And we see this man, I hope you see the relation that I'm trying to pull up here. We see this man, Adonisaac, the king of Jerusalem, the false king of Jerusalem, the fake king of Jerusalem, the pagan king of Jerusalem. We see him form a coalition of kings and go against Joshua, the people of God. Joshua, the name God is salvation. The same name that we see in the Greek, Jesus. He's a picture. Joshua is a, is a picture. He's a type of Christ. Amen? Amen? And we see a perfect picture that God is beginning to paint here. You see, Ananasidic is a picture of Antichrist. He's a picture of that, that lawless one that will rise up his head one day. Amen. That false leader. He'll call himself God. Amen. You know, just like the sun standing still, just like Jonah in the belly of a big fish, people, when you begin to talk about the last days, when you begin to talk about the Antichrist, or you begin to talk about Jesus coming back, or you begin to talk about the tribulation, or, or, the, or the, the millennial reign, or any of those things, they're like, that is way too far-fetched. That doesn't make any sense. Because they, they just they just close that out. Sometimes people close it out for, for the sake of fear. And sometimes people just really don't believe it. They believe it's something that we've been hanging on to for, for centuries now. That's not ever going to happen. But let me tell you something. We're getting close, people. Amen. We're getting close. And they think it's just fairy tales. That it's futuristic fantasies. But I'm here to tell you it's not. Amen. Things are beginning to happen today. And we've been seeing it. You don't have to just watch the news to see it. You can go to the dollar store. Amen. You can go to Walmart. And you begin to see these things. Now, understand, I'm not being judgmental of anybody. But what I'm telling you is this. When you see a nation or you see a world of people that will quickly begin to follow somebody that doesn't have a clue what they're talking about, that just says something because they can then you're beginning to see a people in a world that will easily follow the lawless one. Right. Amen. Amen. You're beginning to see a group of people that will follow somebody just because they're in a place of authority anywhere. There comes a time, church, where we have to begin to stand our ground. Amen. 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 We have to begin to stand our ground. Amen. 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 Right. I promise I'm not going to get on the sofa. I got one foot on, but I'm going to try to keep from putting the other one on there. So this king, he led a confederation of kings against Joshua and against Israel. Look at look with me in Revelation chapter 17. I want to help you to see this picture that we see in Joshua. 
Revelation chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 12 and 14, 12 through 14. Revelation 17, verses 12 through 14. It's the last book, if you didn't know that. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. And they will wage war against the lamb. Notice the coalition of kings that will wage war against the Lamb, led by the beast, led by the one that will be that false king. They will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will triumph over them because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And with him will be his call. With him will be his call. With him will be his chosen and faithful followers. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's good news, isn't it, church? That's right. That's good news. But listen, let me tell you something. We see a perfect picture here of something that will happen in the future. I had a man the other day ask me. I was leaving work. And he said, he said, brother. He didn't say brother. He said, preacher. He said, preacher. He said, what does the good book say about the stuff we're hearing about? And I said, well. I said, actually, it says a lot. I said, not specifically. I said, but when you begin to look at how people are acting. And you begin to see the things that are going on in the world. I said, listen, the one thing I can tell you is the Bible tells us is this, is that one day there's going to be a trumpet sound. Oh, I and I said, that. if you're not saved, you're not going to hear that trumpet. Right. I said, if you're not saved, you're not going to hear it. You're going to be looking around at all the chaos and you're going to be like, what in the world is going on? And he said, you know, he said, I remember when I was a kid going to church. He said, I was forced to go to church. And I remember hearing people talk about these things. He said, I remember terms like antichrist. I remember terms like rapture. I remember terms, people talking about things like this. And he said, it's, this has triggered something. This made me want to go back and try to learn those things. Because I remember it has something to do with things that we're seeing today. He said, and I, I want to figure out what that's all about. And I said, well, that's good. I said, because people need to begin to wake up. Right. People need to begin to wake up because it won't be long, amen, and we'll be hearing that sound. Hallelujah. Second Thessalonians, look with me. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple. Proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now... You know what is holding him back. So that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. And he will use all sorts of displays and powers through signs and wonders that serve the line. And all the ways that wickedness deceive those who are, who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and to be Amen. saved. Amen. Now I want to show you something here that you probably already know in verse 6 and 7. It says, and now you know what is holding him back. Holding who back? The lawless one, amen? The Antichrist. Who is holding, you now you know who is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret of the lawless, uh, of lawlessness is already at work, amen? The secret of lawlessness is already at work. The secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till who? He. Till he is taken out of the way. You might say, well, who is he? 
He is the Holy Spirit. Amen? He is the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, how, how will he be removed? Let me tell you something. You've heard of the rapture of the church. When the church is taken out, the Holy Spirit goes too. I would not want to be here after that. Amen? I would not want to be here for that. We have a hard enough time, many of us, serving God with the presence of the Holy Spirit available to us. But if you take the Holy Spirit out of the, out of the picture, how in the world, these people that say, well, I'll just wait and see how it goes. And I'll, I'll be part of that second love during that tribulation time. Good luck, buddy, because it's probably not going to happen. If we can't serve God now, when it's easy, how are we going to serve him when it's hard? We don't have a clue what it's going to look I mean, we do have a clue, but we don't really understand what it's going to look like after the church is taken out, after the Holy Spirit is taken out, and we're left with our, somebody's left, not me, because I'm taking the first ride, amen? But, but somebody's going to be left with all this tribulation, uh, and the lawless one being come into power and being able to rule the earth for a while. Listen, I don't want to be here. I'm not going to be here. Amen. And I hope you're going with me. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said this in, in his commentary on this. He said, when the Holy Spirit will be removed, it will be like taking the stopper out of a bottle. The liquid of lawlessness will pour all over the world in that day. Amen. Think of that picture. Amen. Think of that picture. The one who is holding it back when he is removed. That when he is removed, then it's all going to break loose. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the warning we need to be giving people, church. That's the warning we need to be giving people. I don't plan on being here. My ear is tuned to that trumpet sound. Amen. I hope yours is too. Amen. Amen. Look with me in, in Joshua chapter 10, verse 16. We're going to look at the rest of this real quick. Joshua chapter 10, verse 16. It says, now the five kings had fled and hid in the caves at Mechadah. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been, folding, had, had been found hiding in a cave at Mechadah, he said, roll large rocks up, uh, up to the mouth of the cave and post them in there to guard them. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. Attack them from the rear and don't let them reach their cities. For the Lord your God has given them into your hands. And Joshua put them kings to the side. And he said, I'm going to address this later. In verse 20, he says, so Joshua, so, so Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Mechadi, and, 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 and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. I don't guess you would, would you? Don't guess you would. When the sun stands still and large hailstones begin to kill people, and, and, and not, not only that, Joshua's slicing and dicing, I, I, I don't think you would say much either. <laughs> Verse 22, it said, And Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmoth, uh, Lachish, and Eglon. And when they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders, who had come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their, placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, do not be afraid. This is something we hear from Joshua several times. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you're going to fight. Then Joseph put the kings to death, exposed their bodies on five poles, and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them and they took them down from the poles and threw them into the caves, or into the cave where they where they had been hiding. In the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. Now you might say, "Man, this is brutal." It is brutal. It's war, amen. It's brutal. But just remember, these people are inhabiting the land that God had given Israel. That God had already given Israel. They're there. And, 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 and they have to be removed. Amen? They have to be removed. And you might say, well, it doesn't seem like God is very gracious in this story. Well, let me show you something. In Genesis chapter 15, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I'll read it to you. I'm just going to read one verse. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. God is speaking to Abraham. Abraham is there in the land right now, the promised land. 
And God speaks to him. And he says, in the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here. They're going to come back here, he says. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. We see the grace of God in that verse. God is showing grace to the Amorites. They can change their ways. They can leave. They can, they can turn from their wicked ways. But he says the, 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 uh, I just had a moment. The sin. Yeah. I couldn't find where I had it down here. For the sin of the Amorites was not at its full measure yet. It wouldn't be to the fourth generation. You see, the thing that we see here, although it sounds brutal, it sounds bad, we see the judgment of God. We see the judgment of God on these people, the Amorite people. And it just so happens he's using Israel to cast that judgment. He's using Israel to cast that judgment. Judgment will be poured out upon the earth once the church is taken out. Once the Holy Spirit in the church is, is raptured and once we're taken out. And the wrath of God will be poured out. God will use people. He will use all kinds of signs and wonders and all kinds of things that will happen. But we see here a picture of the judgment of God upon these people. And God told Israel that it's your land. I'm giving it to you. You go and I'm going to fight for you. Amen. Just like we looked at last week. He also told them, don't make any covenants with them. Don't let them inhabit your land. Why? Because they will be a stumbling block if you let them. They'll cause you to go this way, and they'll cause you to go that way, and you'll lose your focus. He said they'll be a stumbling block. If he would have left those kings to live, they eventually would have rallied troops and come against Israel again. But no, he put it to death. Amen? He done exactly what God had told him to do. Hallelujah. I wonder what's in your cave. I wonder what's in your cave this morning. What are we hanging on to that we need to let go of? What are we hanging on to that we need to put to death? Amen? You see, these things that we hang on to sometimes, we hang on to addiction. Sometimes we hang on to greed. Sometimes we hang on to hatred. Sometimes we hang on to anger. Sometimes we hang on to unforgiveness. I wonder what's in our cave this morning. What are we holding on to? Sometimes these things that we hold on to, we hold on to them in the caves of our hearts and we don't address the issues. We don't put those emotions to death. Instead, we leave them there to eventually find their way out. We'll leave them there in the cave of our heart. Amen? Some of those things we don't address because of fear, but others we don't address because we just want to hang on to it. Because we just want to hang on to those things. Maybe the, maybe there's addiction in our cave. And, and yes, I want to serve God, but I, I really don't want to let go of this right here. Because I may be, I may be in a bad time and have to go back to this. Maybe, maybe it's greed that, that I want to serve God, but I, I, I can't I can't tie because I just want to hang on to what I've got. Instead of just trusting with everything else. What's in our cave? Maybe it's that unforgiveness, that bitterness that somebody hurt us and we just don't want to let go of it. We just know, yeah, I, I, I want to get past it, but I want to hold on to it over here because if they ever come around again, I, I, I don't, that, that's, that lets me know that I don't want to deal with them again because I don't forgive them for what they did. What's in our cave? What do we need to put death to? Amen. What do we need to cut off from? Amen. Hallelujah. Sometimes people hang on to unforgiveness and hatred because they feel the need uh, to hang on to it because it's their grievances that they fall back on. Because things don't go their way. So you hang on to those things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30, 29 and 30, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, that was pretty strong words, but seriously, those things that we harbor in the cave of our heart that we don't want to let go of that keeps us from serving God the way we should, we need to cut them off. That's right. We need to get rid of them, amen? Because let me tell you what they are. They're trumpet blockers. 
are trumpet blockers. Because those things that we harbor, the unforgiveness, the greed, the, the hatred, the anger, the, 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 the addiction that we hang on to, they will keep us from hearing that trumpet call. That's right. And we need to get rid of them, amen? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impure, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Put them to death, he says, amen? Amen. Put them to death. We need to put those things to death that we harbor in the cave of our heart that keeps us from serving God. Look at look at Joshua chapter ten, and I'm almost done. Praise team, you can begin to come up. In, in Joshua chapter ten, verse forty through forty three. Look with me here. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Notice what he said here. Just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded, he put them all to death. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh, Barnea, to Gaza, and the whole region of Goshen to Gibeon. All the kings in their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. And Joshua returned with all his with all Israel to the camp at Gilead. You know why Joshua and Israel was able to conquer the land? Because they don't know what God told them to do. And they totally destroyed the things that would be stumbling blocks to them. Amen? Amen. The things that we hang on to that will cause us to stumble. We need to get rid of it. Amen. We need to get rid of it. Hallelujah. They first addressed the main problem. They pulled them kings out. And they got rid of them. As gruesome as it sounds, sometimes that's the way we need to treat the things that hold us back. Amen. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if there be if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Right. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Right. Behold, all things are become new. Right. Yes. Hallelujah. Are you new in Christ today? It, it, is, is our new relationship with Christ, is it, is it similar to the promised land that God's given Israel? It's our promised land, amen? It's that new land, that new life, and we don't need to let those old inhabitants keep us from serving God, amen? amen. We don't need to let them keep us from living in that promised land that he's given us, that he gave us on the cross, amen? amen? We need to walk in that thing, we need to walk in that land, and we need to live in that land and not let anything become a stumbling block. We need to cast those things aside. We need to put them to death, amen? amen. We die to ourselves, amen? We die to our own selves every day. Amen. We have to make it a point that we're going to die to ourselves every day. And we're going to go forward and we're going to serve God. Amen. Just like when a nut falls from a tree, it has to die in order to begin to grow. Just like a stalk of corn, the stalk has to die so the ear falls and the ear falls and begins to germinate in the ground and create more corn. Amen. Amen. We're the same way. In, in, in Romans chapter 8 verse 13, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Amen. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3 says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us throw it off. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter, or the author and the finisher of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Storing in shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition for, from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Listen, we need to cast off that throw off that sin that so easily entangles. Amen. Throw off everything that hinders us from serving the Lord and just put it behind us. Amen. Amen. I don't want it no more. Amen. You can have it, Lord. Take it. I don't want it. We need to live in that promised land. Amen? Amen. We need to live in that promised land. Jesus same out and said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. Listen, he wants to give you life this morning. Amen? Amen? He wants to give you life this morning. Hallelujah. We hear all these things that we hear on the news and from other people and things like that. We hear death. We hear doom and gloom, just like Colin was talking about. But what we need to focus on is the things of God. 
We need to focus on the message, the good news, the gospel message, and we need to share it. Amen? We need to share it. Because you've heard me say this before, that if we come into here and, it, and it, this building was on fire, and we was back here in another room and we see that it was on fire, would we come in here and say, hey, we need to get out, the building's on fire? Absolutely we would. Or would we come in here and say, we go up here like this and say, brother, uh, I don't want to offend you. I don't, I don't want anybody else to hear me. But they want to leave because I think the building's going to burn down. And, but, but if that offends you, you just stay right there, okay? I mean, do we want to go about sharing our faith like that? No. Hey, get out. The building's going to burn down. we got to go. Come on, people. Listen, that's how we need to be, with passion. Amen? With passion about what we believe. Because, listen, the building is on fire. Amen? It's on fire and it's ready to go. And we're going to be going out of here. And somebody's got to tell them because when we're gone, who's going to preach it to them? Amen. Who's going to preach it to them? Amen? we got a responsibility, church. Amen. And we need to step up. We need to step I need to step up. We need to step up. Amen? And we need to do our job. We need to cast off them things. We need to throw away them things that, that, that keeps us from serving God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand as we close out tonight or this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is what I want to do. I want everybody to bow your heads and nobody looking around. here this morning, you say, you know what, preacher? You're right. I got some things in my cave and I need to get rid of them. I need to get rid of them because they're, they're the things that I get tangled up in. They're the things that, that keep me from serving God the way I know I should. And I need them to go. I need to be set free. If that's you and you're here today, just between you and God, nobody's looking around. Slip up a hand. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Listen, we all got things in our lives. Everybody's got skeletons in their closet. But if those things are holding you back, if those things are if, the, if those things are trumpet blockers and they're going to keep you from going in that, in that ride, amen. Then you then you lift up your hand. Then you lift up your hand. Don't let it stop you, amen. Hallelujah. God sees those hands. God sees those hands. If you're here today and you say, preacher, you know what? I've never made that confession of faith. I don't have a relationship with Jesus, but I want to. But let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. You can try to pull them kings out of the cave and try to put to death those things that hold you back. You can try to do it on your own. But until you give your life to Jesus Christ, it'll never happen. No one will hear that trumpet call unless Jesus lives in your heart. Amen. So if you're here today and you say, Preacher, you know what? I've never made that commitment, but I want to today. Slip up a hand. Nobody's looking around. It's just between you and God. You say, Preacher, you know what? I, I made that commitment before, but I'm not living it. I want to recommit today. If you fall in that category, slip up a hand. Just between you and God. Hallelujah. God sees those hands. Let's pray. I want everybody to lay your hand over your heart and pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for dying for me. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. I believe you rose from the grave and you did it all for me. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Lord, forgive me. Wash me clean. Help me to live for you. Help me to share my faith. Help me to tell people about you, Lord. Help me to not be afraid. Help me to be bold. Fill me full of the Holy Spirit. Help me to let my light shine. Help me to love people. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, this is what I want to do. I know we're not supposed to do this, but I've been a little bold this morning. If you raised your hand, if you raised your hand.
hands. You meant it with all your heart. I want you to make your way to the altar. I heard a preacher this week. We went to a men's conference. And he said this. He was talking about the altar. And he said, you know, you always hear sermons, kind of like what I said today, about the things that we have in our cave that we need to get rid of. And sometimes we make the altar look like something that we just, we go and we get rid of these things. But let me tell you something. The altar's not just for those that are going to get rid of things. That are going to make a diff going to make a change in your life. Right. You know, the altars were built so you can meet God. It's a meeting place. That's what he said the other night. He said, you know, he said the altars were meant to be a meeting place. It's where we meet God. It's where we spend time with God. So if you're sitting there and you have, you raised your hand and you didn't come down, listen, you need to come down. And you need to put your faith in Jesus. Amen. But if you're standing there and you never raised your hand, but you just want to meet God this morning, this is the meeting place. This is that altar. Every time something happened, we read about it in the Old Testament, they build an altar. They build an altar. It's a meeting place. They would meet God there. Listen, do you want to meet with God this morning? Do you want to spend some time with the Lord this morning? Make your way to the altar. Hallelujah. We'll respect you if you don't want to be around somebody. It's okay. But hallelujah. Make your way. Hallelujah. God is here.